And he says, we're going straight to the top. We're going straight to the biggest publisher in Israel. We're going to get them to publish this book. He says, I've yet to publish a book, but we're going to get them to publish this. And um, with a lot of chutzpah and with a lot of determination, he got it done. So um, I'm excited to see to, to, to invite you to join the first conversation that uh, Rabbi Friedman and Elad are having in person. There have been a lot of conversations over Zoom, over the Atlantic Ocean, but now finally Elad is here. And um, we want to hear, we're going to hear from you how you got to where you are and the ongoing projects and videos and the inspiration that you have and that you can share with others. So without further ado, Mr. Elad Ben Alul and Rabbi Friedman. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's amazing uh, being here in 3D. <laughs> I'm looking at Rabbi Friedman and I'm, uh, I'm like, it's strange that it has more dimensions because <laughs> he's uh, on, my, on my screen for uh, the last uh, three years all the time. So I'm used to two dimensions. And I'm hearing him all the time, but not live. Um, so the story is that um, I was, uh, uh, I'm an anthropologist which means the study of cultures and men, uh, humanity. And um, I was very um, inspired my, by my profession. I loved studying people, cultures, diversity. Um, and my PhD uh, field work was in uh, West Africa in Ghana. Uh, I went to study uh, the use of digital technologies. So as Zalman says, the way technology offers uh, a, a array of new opportunities to people. So in Chabad, it's an opportunity to spread Hasidus, but uh, in other cultures, it's opportunities for other things. But uh, my, uh, my, f my expertise is to, s to show how different cultures use the same technology in unique ways. Uh, so I was learning, uh, I was observing uh, Ghanaians, uh, middle class Ghanaians to see how they use um, technology. Um, and I was living with them and going to, to church with them. And whatever they did, I was going to work with them, uh, eating with them. Uh, you just kind of spend time uh, th the nice thing about anthropology, it's not based on an interview where sometimes it's very artificial and not a survey or something. It's more like uh, m uh, immersing yourself in another reality. So as I am immersed myself in this other reality, I didn't know that I was actually entering uh, a very godly reality. Uh, so for me... It wasn't like I was wasn't like an atheist. I was always um, connected to God in my own way and um, had a, a certain affection to to Judaism, to tradition. But it was it was like numbed. It was on the side because the the main identity was a very cosmopolitan, modern, open-minded, liberal uh, identity, and. As I immersed myself in this African universe, I realized that I'm exposed to a godly uh, presence. Um, it's not that it was holy so much, but it was more like the... the um, God was a fact. In, in Ghana, God is a fact. It's a general fact. It's not like, oh, do you believe in God? Do you don't believe in God? It's, no one cares. What, is, what do you mean? It's a fact. It's, a v it's, so, it's so factual that you cannot uh, ignore it. And you cannot not feel it. It's something that you feel immediately because it's everywhere. And it's shared by everyone. And it's a very... Um, the presence uh, of God is in everything, uh, in every small talk, 
and chat that you have with someone and uh, in every shop the way that the shop will be called like the name of God and everything is very very um, divinely oriented and we're talking about Mivza Antebe, for example. The first time I heard, I knew, I knew Mivza Antebe, I saw the movie, I ever learned about it in school, but the first time I heard about Mivza Antebe as, as a miracle and as a godly uh, historic event was from Ghanaians. They're telling me Mivza Antebe is, is complete uh, divine supervision. Uh, the Hebrew soldiers speaking in Hebrew and then the their their brothers and sisters were um you know because they were they were they wanted to shoot the terrorists so but they didn't know who's a terrorist and who's not so they had to speak in Hebrew and they said to to um to back down and to kneel down and all and so when they said kneel down, only only the Jews kneeled down, and the people who didn't kneel down, that's the ones who, sh who they shot. So the Ghanaians were telling me that this is the God's language, uh, connecting God's people, and protecting them. So I was very inspired by this, like seeing this from from an, from their perspective, and um, what's nice about anthropology is that you go to study someone else but you actually learn a lot about yourself so by the time i came back i was uh, very much convinced that i should be taking my jewishness much more seriously and um, keeping shabbat feeling and learning much more about who i am but uh, it came with a price because I felt like um, wh what are my choices really? Like, should I go and become religious? It didn't seem like a realistic option. It didn't seem very, a uh, very attractive option. Um, it felt like I had to, to kill everything I am and who I am doesn't uh, really go in accordance with it's like my way or God's way, my way or the, the, the Jewish way. There's, there's no way to, to live both. And then y you feel uh, lots of, of tension and strength, uh, uh, lots, of, lo lots of tension and lots of, of uh, uh, anxiety because uh, you don't know. The fact that there is something is true doesn't mean that you can actually align yourself to this truth. You have a certain circumstance. You're born into a certain reality and certain education, a certain environment. You live a certain life. And when something drops on you like this, you don't really know how to how to react because you want to be real, but you also want to be realistic. <laughs> um, so it was a difficult and confusing time until I came across a video on YouTube. Um, only God knows how this video popped in, um, but uh, it was somehow suggested, and it said, uh, "Warning: Religion may be bad for you, or uh, don't be religious." <laughs> and um, the person is a rabbi. Looks like a even an Orthodox rabbi <laughs> with a with a beard, and a hat. And uh, I thought, okay, that's worth a listen. And uh, from the second that I started listening, everything made sense and was already much more clear. It wasn't only that, that uh, it was liberating and relaxing, but also academically, anthropologically, it I felt like uh, like um, Rabbi Friedman is, is kind of speaking my profession, but in a, in a Hasidic language maybe, but, but, but he's talking about Jew the Jewish people, about what it means to be human, 
uh, what me wh wh what is the what is the role of of the Jewish people? What is religion? What is not religion? Uh, questions and and the ideas and themes that in 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 my profession we talk about, but it was a very refreshing angle. And uh, the video actually later on I'm gonna uh, as the story evolves. Uh, Yossi and I started translating, Yostef here, we started translating uh, those videos because we knew that Israelis have to, to watch them. So this original video that I saw the first time, we, we translated it and edited it and ad added music to it and, and uh, started distributing it in Israel. So you can see, uh, it's a good point to show the video that I first saw that opened a whole new path uh, of thinking uh, in my life and a new chapter in my life. Is religion good for the world? It's a good question, isn't it? Without God, the world has no direction, no purpose, and no soul. Without the Ten Commandments, the world has no instruction, no right and wrong, doesn't know up from down. Is that religion? When a Jew puts on tefillin, is he being religious? I don't think so. He's being Jewish. A woman goes to a mikveh, is she being fanatically religious? No, she's just being Jewish. Judaism was never a religion. It's not a religion, and it mustn't be a religion. Religions developed out of Judaism, but Judaism is not a religion. Religion, for all practical purposes, means living a certain way in order to gain favor above. You read the Ten Commandments, you go through Torah from cover to cover, it doesn't say anything about going to heaven. Nothing. So in Judaism, going to heaven is not the goal. Because, you know, to get there, you have to die. Instead of wanting to go to heaven, which is the goal of most religions, Judaism wants to bring God down to earth. Why? Because that's what God asked. That's what the Torah is all about. God telling us how to bring him down to earth, not how we can get to heaven. When you're doing what God needs, instead of having him do for you what you need, that's not exactly a religion. What God needs is godly. If you're doing what he needs, you're being Godly, much better than religious. Because religion can become very selfish. It can become very competitive. It can become self-serving, arrogant, exclusive. If the world is supposed to be comfortable and inviting to God, it's got to be the whole world. Nobody is left out. So if you're in the service of God, you are much more open-minded, as open-minded as God. The problem with religion, besides starting wars, it burdens you and it puts you at the center of the universe. You have needs. God is only here to help you with your needs. He's your valet. He's your butler or your savior or your healer or your lover or your protector, but he's busy full-time taking care of you. You are the center of the world. This is not Judaism, and it's not healthy. So Judaism is not a religion, and Jews are not religious. Have you noticed that? 40 days after God spoke to us personally and said, make no graven images, 40 days later, we said, Wonder what would happen if we do. 
Moshe said, in our defense. Yeah, isn't it great? They're such stiff-necked people. And God said, yeah, you're right. I like that. Religion says you are obligated, you must, you have to. What's going to be with you? Get your act together. Not only religion. Society. Every child is told you have to go to school. You have to get good grades. You have to get a job. You have to get a house. And then you have to pay the mortgage. <laughs> so then you say, all right, that's it. I'm going into religion. Right? Religion brings you peace of mind, comfort. And what do they tell you? You think you have problems in this life? You need to be saved from what happens up there. What do you do? Where do you go? And you know what people are saying today? I didn't ask for this. You made me, so you pay for me. Doesn't that make sense? You don't need to be here. You don't need to be born. You didn't ask to be born. If you were asked, you would have said, no thanks. I need this like a hole in the head. If I don't need this, who does? You've answered all of life's questions. You know what Judaism actually says? In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. In the beginning means before you had any needs. Before there was you and before you had needs, he created the world. So who has needs? The creator of the world has a need. He created a world and it just doesn't cooperate. He's got problems. We don't. And amazingly, the fulfillment of his need depends on us. What a relief. Every minute of the day, there is something I can do for him. And once I get to heaven, I won't be able to do that. Well, then I'm staying here. Makes our burden so much lighter. That's inspiring. That's uplifting. I can do for you. That is much better than doing for myself. So here's your choice in life according to Judaism. It's very simple. Do you prefer to be needy or would you rather be needed? Our needs? Eh. Didn't even ask to be born. So don't get religious. Get godly. That's it? <laughs> that changed your life? Yeah, the truth is, is this working? Yeah. The truth is that um, this came out of nowhere. You called up and you said, let's do this. And I, uh, <laughs> like, it sounded like you were already done, like you had already written the book. So, yeah, you were halfway through already. So, okay, so it's done. Too late to back out now. So it's interesting that Mashiach comes, Behesach Hadas. Mashiach comes unexpectedly. As much as we talk about it, and as much as we look forward to it, and as much as we uh, anticipate, it, it, it eventually, ultimately, it will be a surprise because it's not the way we think and it's not what we think. It'll be much better. Right? So it's Behesa Hadas. So every step on, in the way towards Mashiach seems also to come unexpectedly. That the book would come out so quickly that I didn't have to write it. <laughs> <laughs> I barely had to edit it. And that it would make such a impact on Israeli society. This is this is an amazing thing. And it proves the uh, the theory that what is true, what is 
what, what is MS is universal. That you can say the same thing to any human being in the world and it will be meaningful and relevant and practical. You can say it to the most religious person who thinks he's the closest thing to God so far. And you can say it to somebody who doesn't, doesn't believe, has no idea, has no interest. And it has the same impact and the same relevance and the same uh, aha moment. That is an incredible thing. You can actually see when we say the Torah is true, it's the truth with a capital T. What makes something true with a capital T? If it was always true, it will always be true, and if it's true for everybody. If it's only for some people, only sometimes, or only temporarily, then it's not true. So really, the success of the whole thing is the fact that it's true. That we were able to put this together and be uh, the vehicle for it is an amazing blessing, personal blessing. So I think it's time for another book. <laughs> because in this book, we touch on uh, five different topics, big themes. Well, each theme in the book needs its own book. Develop it further and explain it better and just have another book. <laughs> you know, once you start, you don't stop like potato chips. <laughs> you, if one is good, two is better. If two is good, three is better. Huh? So I understand you're already working on another book. Yes, Baruch Hashem. Can you talk about it or it's top secret? <sighs> the thing is, um, the success, it, it, it's, it's very interesting because when I was writing this book, I, I wasn't worried, will it succeed, will it not, what will happen if no one reads it. Sometimes when you do something, you're worried, like... Um, you're not sure if people are going to like it, if people are going to connect. Especially, like, um, we have enough rabbis in Israel. <laughs> There's plenty of things in America that we don't have, but rabbis we have. <laughs> and people don't listen to, to non-Israeli rabbis because what's the point? You have Israeli rabbis. And um, uh, it's the one topic that you have uh, that you can consume in Hebrew. Uh, and plenty of um, and I'm unknown and the rabbi was unknown but I had no doubt that I'm holding an atom bomb like for me it was clear I'm, we're about to change the world I felt like I'm, I'm holding something incredibly uh, uh, powerful and um, it wasn't a question for me that it's going to be a, some, a new chapter in, in Israeli uh, society we have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in it's informal it's questions and answers it's conversation it's really relaxed, it's really pleasant, enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program, there's a um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs, and there's a Wednesday night program. All of it, just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us, take a look. Click uh, the link below and see which, which of the three suits you best and join us for some enjoyable conversation.